Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, let's uh, all grab your lunch and uh, be seated so that we can get started. So, um, my name is Gaiman Yi. I'm the uh, technical director of, of the I4 Energy Center, and welcome to uh, today's uh, seminar. I also want to uh, welcome those that are viewing today's seminar on, on the internet. So, uh, today's speaker is uh, Stephen Lowe. He is a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at Caltech. His research interest is in control and optimization of communication and cyber physical networks, such as in the internet and the power networks. Uh, his current research focuses on fundamental issues in network architecture, energy efficiency of next generation data centers, and all aspects of the smart grid, such as analysis, design, and deployment of information and communication technologies in power networks, integration of renewable and distributed generation, demand response, electricity market design, and games. <coughs> Professor Lo holds BS degree from Cornell University and an MS and PhD degrees from, of course, UC Berkeley. Welcome back. Thank <laughs> you very Lo. much. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. So I'll talk about uh, two topics, if I have time. One is optimal power flow, and if we have time, we'll talk about demand response. It'll be great. It's very good to be here and see uh, former teachers and friends. OK, so uh, this is how much we consume all types of energy, more than uh, just electricity. And electricity is only 2.2 terawatts. And how much we're capturing from nature is a tiny bit in wind and in solar, compared with the potentially harvestable wind power over land. So there are different numbers depending on the assumptions you made, but it's many times the energy demand, all sorts of energy that we need, and much more in solar. Again, potentially harvestable solar power over land. So nature has more than we need. It's up to us engineers to capture it, transmit it, and manage it, which is difficult. But that's ex exactly the kind of research Berkeley is known for. So the barrier is high, so it's a potential reward. So that's one motivation among many for renewables. The challenge with renewable, again, there are many of them, and one of them is that the uncertainty of the renewable supplies. So this is the output power from a Southern California wind farm as a function of time. So there's 24 hours in a day, 30 curves, one for each day. So we can see that the output power can fluctuate rapidly by large amount and randomly, and that's the challenge. Same thing with solar. Not only we don't have sun at night, again, the solar power output can fluctuate rapidly, randomly, by large amount. So the whole infrastructure, both the engineering structure and the market structure, is not built to accommodate such fluctuation in supply. So right now, we essentially can predict demand relatively accurately and then schedule supply. Now, if we have 5% of wind and solar, no problem. If we have 50% or 80% of wind and solar in the system, then you, you, you cannot work. Right? So that's the motivation. And therefore, the current control paradigm works well today is mainly if you look at it, why area control at least, is centralized, open loop, very much human in the loop if you look at uh, ISOs, and worst case, preventive. And it works fine because we don't have a lot of uncertainty and few active assets, few gener say 9,000 generators, for example. But in the future, when we have a lot of DERs, so electric vehicles, wind turbines, solar panels, or smart appliances and demand response loads and so on, we could have hundreds of million endpoints that are active. They're not just passive loads, but they're active endpoints that can generate, that can measure, that can communicate, compute, and actuate. So if we have a large network of such active endpoints, they fluctuate randomly, then we have to close the loop. And we have to be able to do very fast computations to cope with these large rapid ra random fluctuations in supply, in demand, in voltage, and frequencies, and so on. Right? And we have to have simple algorithms to be able to scale to such a large network of active endpoints right? and, and do real-time control. Right? So that's the, uh, that's the challenge. So what I'll talk about today is, especially the first part, is how do we work towards a faster computation in the context of uh, optimal power flow. So power flow is extremely important. It's a fundamental problem that underlies many 
management control issues in Power Network. Right? So uh, it's a joint work with uh, Bose, who is a graduate student at Caltech. Professor Manny Chandy, uh, Chris Clark is an engineer at Southern California Edison. We work closely with uh, for Riva. He's also a graduate student. Denise Gamey, he's a, uh, he was a graduate student. He's now a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. And Javala Viet, uh, he was a student. He's now a postdoc at, at, at Stanford. So that's the first part. Um, if I do have time, then I get to the second part, John work with Li Jun Cheng. He was a student and now a professor at Colorado. Uh, Li Bin, he was a student of Sean Barron at Berkeley, uh, now at Qualcomm, and Lina uh, at Caltech, graduate student at Caltech. Okay, so optimal power flow. So the GAN is extremely important. It is solved routinely every day, every hour, in real times, and so on, around the world. It is used not only to compute which generators to generate how much by when, also to set transformer tabs, the engineering configurations, and so on, and also set prices. So it's, it's a very important problem that is being solved and used every day. The, uh, there's a huge literature since the first formulation uh, in 1962. It's a non-convex optimization problem. It's hard to solve not only because it's large size, but also because it's non-convex and therefore no one really understands the structural properties of, of uh, uh, power flows. So in practice, what people do is that they solve a linearized version. So they solve the linear program, which we can solve easily, and they use the nonlinear system to check whether it is feasible. If it's not feasible, you tweak it and do it again. If you get a feasible point, that's probably what you use. And then plus some human intelligence, maybe tweak it a little bit. That's, that's essentially how that is done in practice. So you solve the linearized version. OK, so uh, again, there's a last literature. It was first formulated in 62. Uh, lots of papers and surveys that propose different algorithms to compute it uh, numerically. So it was interesting in 2008, Bayan Tell observed that you can formulate optimal power flow as a, as, as a QCQ, quadratically constrained quadratic program, basically. And therefore, there's a standard way to look at SDP realization, which is convex, of that QCQP. So the numerical illustrated method on the actual test systems, uh, but they didn't study really under what condition would it turn out to be exact. It turned out to actually compute an optimal value right, for the non convex problem. So uh, Javar Lavey at Caltech, a student, figure out a sufficient condition under which the relaxation turns out to be exact. And therefore, you can solve the simple problem and get an optimal solution for the original problem. So what I would focus on is, is, is the, uh, the word after that. So what happens if you have a radio network? That is, if your network graph is a tree. It turns out if you have a tree, things become much simpler. Right? So this is work by uh, Bose at Cal, and then there's also work uh, here at Berkeley uh, David Xue and his student, and Somayat and Lavayet. And there's some other interesting work since then. And the second part of this uh, OPF, uh, I'll talk about a, a, a different model, equivalent model. Everything is just Kirchhoff law, but equivalent model also came out of uh, Berkeley, uh, Professor Felix Wu and his student way back. And, and we can formulate the OPF on this model, and then there's some interesting results one can show uh, using that model. So these are two different models. Uh, where you can look at OPF. So I'll, I'll describe what, what it is. So there were equations, but don't worry about the details. I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the ideas behind the equations and their implications. So the equations are nothing but just shorthand uh, notations. OK. So, so just some notation. So the network is, consists of, a, uh, say, a bus, which there can be generation connected to the bus and low connected to the bus, so bus I and J and K connected by transmission lines or, or, or lines. Right? So the lines are described by an impedance. Right? So the branch flow, which is this complex variable, which is the complex power flow from I to J. So that's the notation. Sij simply means the power flow from I to J. Right? That's all it is. The um, bus injection power is simply sum of all the power flows coming out of bus J, right? sum over all the J's connect, all the K's connected to J. So that's this variable, right? So the difference is that SIJ are the power flows in the branches in the network, and the bus injection are the powers coming out of a node, right? So we don't look at the interior, right? 
So these are two variables you can look at either one of them. You can formulate a model, you can look at ROPF uh, using either this variable or that. And we'll do both, right? so two parts. Again, so it could be a tree, but it could also be a mesh. And again, there's a bus i, bus j, there's a line between them, and the impedance that describes the line is given. So that's the only thing that is given, everything else is variable. Right? So the currents I, I, J, again, is the complex current from I to J, and the voltage at each node. So these are the variables. So again, we can look at everything just by looking at the branch flows or equivalently look at the bus injection. These two models, I guess, again, the same thing. I, I, Js are the branch current flows. If you sum out all the branch flows coming out of a node J, that's the, the current injection from node I. Again, the two different variables, IIJ and IIJ. So the difference between these two variables is that if you look at the bus nodal variables, then the Kirchhoff law is this very simple linear relationship between the, branch, the nodal currents and the nodal voltage. Right? Whereas if you look at the branch flows, then the Kirchhoff law looks a little bit more complicated. They're equivalent. You can look at either this or that. So let's look at the first one first. Okay, so look, so look at this model. Okay. So the nodal variables. So that leads to this SCP relaxation. If you look at the branch flows, it turns out there's a calling relaxation we'll talk about. Right? And then I'll talk about who cares. Right? So if you, do, you can do all this thing, have fast computation, how much benefit can you get? Right? So that's the, the, the last. So the first model, again, the bus injection, the thing that is given, the network that is given is described by this simple matrix. So don't worry about what it is. It's basically just a bunch of impedance that describes the network and its topology. That's all it is. It's, it's summarized by a matrix, Y. And again, the important thing is that with this matrix, then the nodal variables, the currents and the voltages, are related by this simple linear relationship. So OPF, then, is simply a problem to minimize certain costs. Think of that as generation costs. Or it can be network loss, power loss in your network. Right? Certain costs subject to some constraints over the variables which are the nodal voltages, which VK for all the buses K, and the nodal power flows, complex powers. Right? So there's a nodal power, there's nodal voltages that describes your, your network, and you want to op choose this to optimize certain costs. Right? So don't worry about the details, it's just a structure. And the constraints are described by this, so the, the, the power has to be lie, has, has lie between certain lower bound and upper bound. The voltages has to be between, say, 120 volts plus or minus 5%. Five, five, five On transmission network, it's a lot higher than 120 volt, but whatever the nominal voltage, plus or minus a, a few percent. So, or, right? And then you have this Kirchhoff law, this linear relationship we saw before, and then really just uh, supply equals to demand at each bus. So, that, so these are Realist, uh, uh, reasonable constraints that defines the power flow, uh, feasible set, right? So this is the OPF problem. Right? So uh, it's non-convex, it's hard to solve. If a large system, we don't really understand the structural properties. Right? We can try to compute numerically and get something, but, uh, but there's not much understanding of when the, if we get a solution, whether it is optimal, how bad it is from optimal, and so on. Okay, so you can play some tricks and convert this problem into an equivalent problem. The only thing I want to point out is that nothing changes except that you can eliminate the, one of the two variables. You can eliminate the nodal powers. So that the entire problem involves only one variable, which is this uh, voltage. Right? So it, it looks like this. Details are not important. The only thing is that now the only variable is this voltage, complex voltage vector. That's all it is. Moreover, this complex voltage vector appears always in VV star. Everywhere it appears, it appears in the form of VV star. So the idea then is that instead of think, thinking of V as the variable, you can think of this VV star, which is a matrix, as your variable. That's, that's all it is. Right? So, so this observation was made by by uh, 2008. And therefore, you can write this, again, into a, another problem. Nothing changes except now I write 
W as my matrix variable instead of V. Everything remains the same. Okay? So, so it looks like this. So W is now my variable. Everything else is the same. But the important thing is that if you look at this problem, everything's linear. It's just simple. It means everything is simple except this one constraint. So the only source of non-convexity is this rank constraint. Everything else is simple. And therefore, we, get, we have this non-convex problem. And be hard, we don't know how to solve because of this. Let's just ignore it. So we get a simple problem. Right? So we can solve the simple problem. So the strategy is that we get this OPF, we can pick that tree and convert that into a optimization over the, ver over the, the, um, uh, the matrix, and the only non-convexity is this rank constraint on the matrix. So drop that, we get a simple problem, we can solve it. Once we get the matrix W, we check if the rank constraint that we throw away is satisfied. If it is satisfied, then we are lucky, we, we, we are done, so we get the optimal solution. If it is not satisfied, then we're stuck. So there's a recent paper last year from Wisconsin that says if you solve this thing, if you're unlucky and you go down that branch, you get a solution that does not have rank one. Then the solution, in general, is not physically meaningful. So we don't know what to do. Okay? And therefore, it's important to know under what condition we will actually go down this path and actually get an optimal solution. So that's what Javad did. Uh, so, so Again, details are not important, but you can, you can, you can, you can, cons you can solve this simple problem, uh, SDP, and then you can form a certain matrix that depends on this Lagrange multipliers and stuff. But it's some matrix, okay? So what Javad figured out is that if this matrix at optimal point has ran n minus one, then everything works. That the SDP, the W, the, the matrix turns out to, be, to have rank one, the SDP relaxation is exact, you can derive the gap is zero, and you can, more importantly, you can recover the globally optimal voltage vector, which is the optimal solution of your original OPF. And therefore, that gives us a way to efficiently solve, hopefully, large-scale OPF. So um, what is surprising is that he looked at all the IGB test systems, and they essentially satisfy his condition. So, so what I want to talk about now is that, uh, so we don't quite understand why, right? So you can certainly, there are certainly example networks in the literature uh, for which it doesn't work. But the IGB test system, they all seems to work. So we don't understand, uh, we don't quite understand why, except if it is a tree. If it is a radio network, there, there are some other conditions as well, which I would say is less, less important. But if you have a radio network, then everything works. His condition is always satisfied under some other conditions that I ignore. Right? And therefore, if you have a radio network, you can solve it easily. So that result was presented by both uh, in Erlerton. It turns out at the same conference, David Zay and his student, looking at, uh, 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 in a different context, come to the same conclusion using the same technique. And then there's also a work by Javad and Somayat uh, that, that comes to the same conclusion. So essentially, if you're a tree, everything is fine. Okay, so that's the, um, and then you can, general, you can generalize this result, just look at, in general, if you have a QC, QP over a tree, then there's a slightly more general condition than, than, than this lower bound stuff. Okay, so that's the, the, the key message is, is that for radio networks, it's simple to solve. Okay. All right, so let's, let's look at if we use um, Baran-Wu model, right, a branch flow, mo flow model. So again, this is something we saw before. The branch flows are simply the power flows or currents on the branches inside the network, right? We're not looking at the nodal uh, variables, but actually looking at the variables on the branches, okay? And then the Kirchhoff law takes these particular forms, not that important, uh, and then Ohm's law, and then say, so there's three set of equations that defines your system. That's all it is. Okay. So data's not that important, but your system is described by these three, three, three sets of equations. All right, so, uh, so, so we can formulate OPF over this model as well, equivalent to, to, to the other one, but okay. So the, you, can, you can use different objective functions, uh, say that one um, popular one is you want to minimize the number of laws, you want to do this uh, energy conservations and stuff, right? So there's some variable that 
the, the variable, the, the only thing, important thing is that the variable depends on the magnitude of the currents on the branches and the voltages, magnitude of the voltages. Right? So no angles. That, that's the only thing that is important. Right? So you, you, all you care is about the magnitude of the voltage and current, that's all. You don't care about the phase. So, um, so you can form an OPF. It takes this form. Again, don't worry about the detail. This is whatever the objective function that depends on the magnitude. Uh, and then you have this uh, same kind of thing. The voltage, has to, the voltage magnitude has to be between 5% of your nominal values and all, the same thing. Right? The same thing as we saw before, it just takes different form. All right, so that's the OPF. Again, it's non convex large scale. We don't know what to do. We don't quite understand the structures and all that. So, so the strategy is that starting with this thing, all these are complex variables and all that, uh, you can eliminate the angles of the voltages and currents and get a problem that depends only on the magnitude of the currents and voltages and the complex power. Okay. But for the currents and voltages, you eliminate the angles. Right. So that's, that's, that's all it is. <laughs> Sorry. So that's the uh, brown Wu model, which was first proposed for, for distribution networks, uh, capacity placements and sizing. Right? That is still, so we call this OPF AR. Right? It is still non-convex, but it turns out there's a very simple convex realization of this problem. And therefore, the strategy is to, to solve this problem and under appropriate assumptions, essentially if you have a tree, then this is always exact. Well, you don't actually, you don't need a tree. Uh, this is always exact. You can always get an uh, exact realization of, of this problem, which doesn't have angle. If you have a tree, then there's an inverse map that gives you the original problem with phase angles on the voltages and currents. Right? And therefore, if you have a tree, then we are in luck. We can go back. If we have a mesh, this time we may break down. So we'll come back to this point. Okay, so, so let's, basically that, that's what it is. <laughs> so let me just give a bit of detail into each, each one of, each, each step. Uh, ag so again, <laughs> don't worry about the detail, but you can eliminate the angle and then this becomes the equivalent problem. The only thing to note is that there's no angle on the voltage or current. So P's and Q's are the complex powers, so your angles are in the powers, but L's are the current magnitude square, and the small v's are the voltage magnitude square. Right? So no angles, that's all it is. So if you look at this thing, everything is linear. Objective function is linear in the variables. Constraints are linear except this one quadratic equality, and that's the only source of non-convexity. And therefore, the natural thing to do is Oh, oh, before we know that. So in the context of, so what is demand response? Demand response corresponding to adapting these two quantities. So this is the real power, cons real power consumption and uh, reactive power consumption. I don't know whether this, whether, okay. The, and, then, uh, and then this can be, say, in the context of wall control, for example, then this can be the, the solar power generation at bus J, and this can be the, the wall, I don't know whether I should go and point. I don't know how the video works. Um, but, but that VAR thing is, is, uh, is what you control at, at the end. Okay? So, so you, you can think about demand response and VAR controls and stuff with network underlies, underlying that. Right? Okay, again, this is a non-convex problem, hard to do, but the only non-convexity is, is this equality. So the natural thing to do is, again, to, 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 to drop the equality and make it inequality. And then, you can show that this is conic realization, it's convex, and we know how to solve it. Okay. So that's the, that's the CR thing. Okay, so, um, so you can show that if, again, if you have a radio network, uh, then both steps, both relaxation, relaxation steps work. And therefore, uh, you, uh, you, 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 you can solve the original OPF uh, exactly. All right. What happens if we have mesh? Well, again, this time it will fail. Okay. 
So, so what can we do? Okay, so, so here's one thing we can do. So think about the, OP so this is the OPF we saw before. It's the same thing, right? It's, it's the same thing with the complex powers, with all the angles and everything we had before. So it, you can represent this problem simply, just different notation, said I want to minimize certain function that doesn't depend on angle over a certain set x. So I haven't done anything, or I say it's okay. Then when we relax the angle, what happens is that instead of optimizing over this, this difficult set x, x, okay, we optimize over a larger set, which is y. So y is a lot simpler. It's still non-convex, but you can, have a con uh, you can look at the convex hull, then that's the convex uh, corner realization. But y is much simpler than x. It's a superset. Okay. Now, if I allow myself phase shifters in the network, that is, suppose I can have a phase shifter, dynamically tunable phase shifter in every link in the network, then I can ask, when I, can I minimize the cost function over not only the variables that I had before, but also by ultimately tuning the phase shifters on every link? So that enlarges my feasible set to another set x bar. Right? So the original problem corresponds to phase angle equals zero. So if I choose every phase shifter to have angle zero, then I get the original problem. But more generally, I can optimize the phase angles. Okay? So I get, I get, a, I get a, 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 a different network, slightly different network with, phase, with, with fax devices, let's say, right? uh, uh, which corresponds to a larger feasible set. Then you can show that these two sets, x bar and y, are the same. So what does that mean? So it means that if we, what we proposed before, right, if a tree, don't solve this OPF, solve this OPF AR by solving this commercialization, and you're guaranteed a good solution. And therefore, when you solve OPF AR, what happens is that you're solving over this set y. If we are lucky, we get a point in x. Then we can go back. We can go back, compute the angles for the voltages and currents. Then we solve the original problem. But if we are unlucky and get a point in y, not in x. So the solution of this OPFAR is not in x, but in y. Then we are stuck. So what happened in a tree is that for tree, x equals y. And then we are always lucky. We just solve this thing. We always get a point in x. And then we can go back, compute the angles. We're done. If it's a mesh, x is a strict subset of y. And therefore, we can solve this problem and get a point that is on x. Now, if this x bar equals y, what it means is that you can solve this problem, get a certain point, which if it turns out not to be in x, you can always implement that by choosing the right phase angles. And therefore, you can always solve a simple problem and implement that solution. So your network now is, is more costly because of phase shifters and all that. But two things. One is that the, where you need to, one is that you, you can show that you only need phase shifters outside a spanning tree. Doesn't matter what spanning tree. You can choose one spanning tree. You can have some optimization to choose that. But choose one spanning tree, and you need phase shifters only outside that spanning tree. Now, two things. One is that, Practical networks are very sparse, which means you don't have a lot of links. It's not like n squared. You don't have a lot of links outside the spanning tree. And therefore, the number of phase shifters may be manageable. From the attribute test systems, it seems to be relatively small. Secondly, it's a one-time cost. So the, where you need to place the phase shifters depends only on the topology. It doesn't depend on generation or the load or constraints, which may change and all that. And therefore, it's a design problem. So when you design your network, you can choose to put phase shifters somewhere. There's one-time deployment cost, and then you get this simplicity in your operations forever. Right. So, 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 you, so, you, so, you, so we pay the cost and convert the NP-hard problem into a problem that we can always solve. Okay, so, so, uh, so, so the point is that if we have a radio network, then we should, we should exploit it. And if we have a mesh, then perhaps we 
We just think about design for simplicity. Okay. All right. Oh, okay, so who cares? <laughs> so this is a, a, a project that we work with Southern California Edison. They have a, a, a initiative to put up rooftop uh, uh, solar panels on warehouses. So these are large systems, much bigger than the, the, uh, the households and stuff. So we looked at one of their circuits, uh, color bath circuit in Southern California. Uh, and, the, and the issue is that when you have these fluctuations, uh, it may be hard to maintain voltage right, within the limit. So uh, currently, what you do is you have these uh, static capacitors that you, you, you change the configuration. But no more than, say, five times a day, because it damages the equipment and all that. Right? And therefore, if the fluctuation is mainly due to low, which changes slowly, then this is enough. But if you have a lot of solar that can fluctuate rapidly, then this is not enough. So luckily, uh, you, could, uh, you could do uh, wall control using uh, inverters. We don't really do that today. The actual test system just says, do this unity power factor. Essentially, you don't optimize the wall. But in principle, you could optimize the wall at much more frequently, uh, almost real time, and all that, assuming you have the capability. Assuming the hardware has the capability, which they don't today but there's no reason we can't put a little chip in there. Okay, so what happened, so look at this, so, uh, so, so we looked at the, uh, the low profile on that circuit, we look at the, uh, the solar irradiance data on, in the area and all that, and then you can, you, you can try simulate under this load and this solar power output and the network topologies and data and all that, if you do IEEE, test, IEEE uh, standard, right, uh, what is the performance? And if you optimally solve it every, say, 15 minutes and adjust the wall control and the inverters, what is, what is the benefit? So let me just, let me just skip, let's skip the detail. Let me just go to the summary. So here, here's the benefit. Uh, oops, okay. So suppose we can only tolerate 3% 3, uh, 3 voltage uh, deviation from the... From, from the nominal, right? So if it's 4%, 5%, let's just look at one row, 3%. Then using uh, those real data for a year, uh, it shows that if you do IEEE test system, then that circuit will spend about 840 hours over the year outside the feasible set, which means some voltage constraints are violated or some power, power flow constraints are violated. So it, it could mean something bad. Whereas if you do the optimal thing, then this becomes zero. If you look at the uh, average power savings, that, uh, so the, the problem is to minimize the line loss and CVR. If you look at the cost, then it saves about close to 4%. So at first we thought, who cares about 4%? But it turns out uh, the Southern California Edison told us that if you can save 1% or 2%, that is significant. So maybe it's worthwhile. Okay, so that's the... Okay, so let's try to spend five, uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes on this uh, demand response. Okay, so, so this is a motivation uh, from a pg and &E. You can save energy, which is the area. You can also save the, uh, reduce the peak. Right? So the, again, peak reduction is important because there's no storage, there's no large scale storage, and therefore the entire infrastructure is, is developed to uh, accommodate the peak. Any way we can reduce the peak, we'll save. So let me describe the model. The, the, really, the only thing I, I want to describe is the model. Right, so the results are uh, okay. I just want to describe the model and maybe get some feedback afterwards and so on. All right, so, uh, okay. So we try to capture three things with, with the model. One is that there's this wholesale market, which is a very elaborate market. Because we don't have storage, we have this elaborate market structure to allow us to predict the demand so that we can schedule supply. And then, oh, our prediction is slightly off, then we fine tune it, right, so that. So we want to capture that, and then we assume there are just two markets. There's a day ahead market where you try to schedule supply for every hour tomorrow. Okay? And then there's a, this real-time market where you try to balance. Right? The second thing we try to capture is this renewable, which is non-dispatchable, it's random variable, that get realized in real time. And the third thing is, 
the consumption, we try to optimize consumption, but in real time. Real time may be every five minutes. You, you, you adjust, let's say. So, so these three things, okay. So the perspective is that we look at this, this boss. So you have this wholesale market, which is the stay ahead market, this real time balancing market, and then you have these renewables, right? So we think of renewables as a separate thing. In, in reality, it's really a part of it. So this is sort of a caricature of the real market. It's, it's, it's a very simpl simplistic model of the real market, of course. Right, so what we want to look at is utility has to play in this wholesale market is to procure a day ahead the powers for every hour tomorrow. And then in real time, once the renewable, got real, renewable power got realized, he has to buy, if necessary, the real time, uh, on the real time market to balance the, the demand. Right? So that's one thing he has to do. So it's, he has to make a decision a day ahead. Right? And then adjust in real time. And then he has to turn around and retell the power to the users. And the users need to consume. So you want to influence the user to make the right consumption decision in real time. Okay. So that's the thing we want to capture. So here's the model. So the user, think of each user as just one appliance. It doesn't really matter. You could have multiple appliances, EVs, that belongs to one user. It's, it's the same thing. Mathematically, roughly, think of this as each user is just one appliance, and it's characterized by two things. One is the utility function UI as a function of how much it consumes in period T. So think of T as every 15 minutes or half an hour or so. So every control period, right? Every control period, it consumes XIT amount of power, and it gets a certain utility, happiness, UI. Okay. And the second thing that criticizes the user or the appliance is that there's consumption constraints. So the consumption has to lie between some lower and upper bound. So this could be zero. The lower bound could be zero. The upper bound can be infinite. And we require... If you look at the consumption over a day for that appliance, it has to be bigger than something. So think of an electric vehicle. I need to be fully charged by 7 a.m. tomorrow. You can sum over all time, because if I cannot charge from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., I just set the uh, both uh, lower bound and upper bound to be zero between the times that I cannot charge. Right? And therefore, you can just look at the sum over the entire day has to be bigger than something. So this, these are two things, the utility function and the cons consumption constraint that describes each user. So the demand in each period T is simply the sum over the user's I. So XIT, sum over I, that's the demand in each period. Okay. So it's deterministic in this model. You can add randomness, but it's, here it's deterministic. Okay, so the, the, the low serving entity or the utility, again, has to make these uh, day ahead decisions, right? So you have to purchase, decide how much power you will purchase for every hour T tomorrow, or every 15 minutes T tomorrow, okay? So this is day ahead, and, and, and pay for that cost. So the cost, so the, the entire wholesale market dynamics is ignored and summarized by this cost function. So suppose the utility company is given this cost function. If you want to essentially make uh, the reserve or buy capacity or PD, then you pay this much. Uh, so this is the control, PD is the control variable. You have to decide a day ahead. And then there's a renewable power that got realized each time at real time. So it's a random variable. Suppose it has zero marginal cost. Okay? CR is zero. And the, tomorrow comes around, you look at the demand, you look at the realized renewable power, that's the net energy that you need for a period T. Uh, and if you need to, then you need to buy that. If, if PD is not enough, then you need to buy this amount on the real time market. Uh, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> so, 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 you, you, so this, is net, this is the net demand when real time comes around, which you can serve with what you bought yesterday, but you have to pay for the energy. Which means even if you don't consume, let's say renewable power that got realized is infinite, you don't have anything that you need to uh, use that you bought, you still have to pay for the capacity, but you don't pay for the energy. Whereas if you use a certain amount of energy up to what you purchase, uh, procure yesterday, then you pay that amount as uh, CO. So that's, that's the day ahead power. Okay, and then if, if this delta X is bigger than what you procure yesterday, then you look at, uh, you, you buy on the real-time market to balance. Right? So the real-time market is not much of a decision. 
you look at the demand, you look at what, is, what got realized, the random power that got realized, you look at how much you have procured, the difference, you just buy it. So therefore, the decision is only that they have power. That's it. Okay. okay. So, so the idea is that you, the model is that we want to use as much renewable power as possible. You want to optimally provision that they have power. And then you just buy whatever necessary in real time to balance. Okay. So <laughs> one thing is that there's no network constraint, unlike in the first part. Right? There's, assume there's no network. So the network has infinite capacity. OK. So then think about what we know at each time and what decision we have to make. Right? So, uh, so, so uh, OK. Uh, they had the utility company needs to decide how much power you will procure for tomorrow. And then uh, in real time, the decision is really on the consumption. How much user I should consume? Okay. Uh, given the realization of the, this random power PR and the procurement from yesterday. Okay. So think about at time t minus 24, right, an hour earlier. What is known in a system? Right? So, we assume the users know their own utility function, UI, which is a big assumption. They may not, but it's reasonable in a way. Okay. We assume the utility company knows the statistics, say the distribution function of the renewable power, FR. And then the utility company needs to make this decision, optimal decision, PD star, which is a procurement a day ahead. And then in real time, PR, which is a renewable power, got realized. PD star was has been made, and the users need to decide how much to consume optimally. Okay, so that's the, and we want to understand how to compute these two decisions, PD star and XI star, and how does the, 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 the system behave? Okay. All right. So, oh, okay. So, so the idea is that, okay, think, think backwards, right? Think about the real time first. So at real time, again, PR is given, the random variable got realized. PD star is also given, known in the, to the system, right, which is the procurement that they uh, decided a day earlier. So given this piece of information, then the optimal consumption decision can be formulated simply as a complex prop, deterministic complex problem. So the, the, the important thing is that deterministic. If I know the win in the next five minutes or next 15 minutes, then I have a deterministic problem that I need to solve. The question becomes, can I solve it efficiently? Can I solve it in a distributed manner? And essentially, if you assume the, 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 the way we formulated, the answer is yes. So it's a simple problem. So, this is, so you solve that problem. You get your optimal decision that is a function of PD. It's also random because it depends on this random variable PR. And therefore, the way we formulate this is to say, I will choose the consumption to maximize a determinist social welfare function, which I will define next slide. Okay. And then this optimal decision is a function of P of D, and therefore the way I would choose P of D is to maximize the expected, optimal social, uh, expected social welfare. Okay. So, so, so that's the idea. So the details is now the next slide, but, but that's the idea. Okay. All right. Okay, so, so let me continue with the model. Okay. So the first big assumption, so I, I, was, I, I actually won't talk about the second thing, only the first thing. And the first thing is that let's ignore this, this constraint. This constraint is problematic. It's difficult. It, it correlates the consumptions and the decisions over time. You can do it. You get a dynamic program. It's, we don't know that much. It's an optimal solution or whatever. But, okay, so ignore that. Okay? And therefore, what it does, so in the simp simpler problem, you just have you can make this consumption decision for each time separately. So there's no correlation across time, basically. Okay? Now in that case, it's equivalent to just two period problem. There's a decision they had, and then there's a consumption decision at time t. That's it, two decisions. Okay? It's just simpler. Notation is simpler. Okay, let's formulate the welfare, of, uh, welfare maximization. So the welfare is, is the standard thing. Um, is, is the sum of the user utility here, right? So each user has a utility function. The goal to choose to solve this system problem is to maximize everyone's utility, the aggregate, minus the supply cost. 
So the supply cost depends on those different types of costs we went through, not important detail. But the, the, the only thing is that the supply cost depends on two variables. It depends on the day have procurement, which is what the utility company needs to make, and the consumption that the user needs to make. Right? So the consumption determines the net energy demand, which determines how much energy cost that the supply needs to pay. Okay? So, and therefore, the, the supply cost depends on these, these two variables. They had decision, optimal, cons and, and consum user consumption. Okay? And therefore, this welfare function is simply this, this function. So if we assume as customary that the utility functions are concave, the cost functions are convex, then you get a simple deterministic convex problem. So the real time, so this is the welfare, so this is the welfare function we define and which is here, right? The, the welfare function. It is random because very in the notation, there's a PR somewhere. But in real time, PR is just a given number, just a given constant. So we get a deterministic convex pro, uh, problem, which is to maximize this welfare function over X, given PD and given PR. So it's a simple complex problem, you can solve it, it has enough nice structure, you can solve it in a distributed manner. That's the only thing I want to say. Okay. Uh, so I, so I, I won't go to detail. So that's the real time problem, right? The, and, and therefore, uh, you solve this problem, you get the optimal consumption as a function of the decision uh, they have procurement. And therefore, the way to choose their have procurement is simply to maximize the expected welfare. Now the expected welfare is a function only of PD, so you can solve that. So under the assumptions we have is complex problem. In principle, you can solve it, dynamic program, no problem, all that. Okay. So the overall problem is, is, is this, that you want to uh, maximize for each realization of PR over the consumption, and then maximize over PD the expected Expect a maximum. Okay. So, uh, a, a popular approach is to say, let's schedule consumption. Let's schedule optimal consumption a day ahead for every hour tomorrow. So that corresponds to the problem where you swap the, the max and the expectation. If you do real-time demand response, then you maximize X for each realization. So you, real, you, you, you wait for the win to realize to, to, to be realized, and then you choose the optimal consumption. If you, so if you don't, if you do the scheduling, you have to predict tomorrow's win, and then you try to schedule your consumption X. Right? So two different approaches. One arguably is simpler. But you can show, not surprisingly, with appropriate assumptions, that the optimal welfare or performance with real-time demand response is higher. And the gap depends on how variable win statistics is. Right? So the more variable win is, the less we can predict, then the more it pays to do real-time demand response. Again, if there's no uncertainty, you schedule everything. With uncertainty, you have to close the loop. OK. And it also depends, uh, and, and the gap also increases if the uh, marginal real-time cost increases. Okay. It all makes sense. So I, th I, think, I, was, I think I will stop here. The, the, the rest are just details to say, yes, you can solve this, uh, this real-time problem in a distributed manner, and there's a simple message passing protocol so you can implement that will solve the problem optimally and all that. So I, I think I'll just stop here. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. <laughs> so open up the floor for some questions. Uh, very nice talk. Um, I have a question about the optimal power flow problem that you presented at the beginning. So the problem you considered is single shot, in the sense you're solving at a single time period. But in practice, the ISO is solving a multi-period problem that involves no load costs, startup costs, and these lead to mixed integer formulations. So how would the, the results you have here actually facilitate solving that more general formulation which has these integer decision variables. Right. So I talked about two models. This branch flow model, we just started, so we haven't looked at all those issues. 
for the first model, there are some results towards that, uh, but not complete. So, so Java has a paper that shows if you add additional constraints, say the line flows, the, um, uh, the shunt capacitors and transformer tabs and all that, it doesn't change the structure. That is, if the problem without these additional constraints uh, is exact, then with constraints will still be exact. Uh, the missed integer uh, cons uh, constraint, we, we, I don't think we have looked at that, that anyone looked at that. Uh, the time correlation, it turns out, so there's some, uh, again, in that model, that shows that if you have time correlation, for example, if you have storage, again, it doesn't change the structure. If the original problem has, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, thanks for the nice talk. And I just was, want to ask one question regarding the optimum power flow studies. And um, I would like to ask whether the XR ratio will affect the results you get or the efficiency of the uh, algorithm you have developed. You mean the XR uh, as, uh, on the impedance, XR ratio, impedance yeah. on the line? React, yeah, reactance over right, the okay. so, resistance. Yeah. Right, so the... <laughs> The re some results we have, again, we don't understand completely, but some results we have is the following. So the, um, it turns out, it's interesting you mentioned this thing. It turns out if your XR ratio is the same for your network, uh, then, uh, then the, 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 then, okay. So something I didn't tell you, the detail, is that the, the proof in, in this particular paper for this relaxation to be exact, has an assumption, which is there's no upper bound consumptions. And that's just an artifact of the proof, I think. You can remove that assumption and, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm lying a little bit, okay, and then if you have XR ratio the same in your network, in your distribution network, let's say, then this step will be exact. So that can be too restrictive. If you look at the distribution network, they may not be the same. But if they are monotonic, it will also work. So indeed, XR ratio plays a role in this relaxation. Yes? It, it seems to me your resource on OPF uh, is more powerful than just uh, providing another algorithm of solving this uh, optimal power flow problem. Uh, since uh, uh, you have the relaxation problem, which has nice uh, structure properties, uh, and then your objective function it can be uh, arbitrary, you know, you can, you can play with the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, objective function. Uh, so have you tried to get uh, any uh, results on the, you know, upper bound, lower bound things? So for example, uh, even for the radio network, uh, trying to get uh, what would be the uh, minimum uh, reactive power required for this uh, substation, uh, you know, or uh, what would be the you know uh, reserve uh, requirements uh, for a power, real power? Have you tried? Uh... So we're trying to understand those issues. We don't completely understand. Uh, so there's some there's some partial results, but the short answer is that we don't understand. Um, numerically, it seems to all work fine. Structurally, we 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 don't quite understand. Yeah, but. Certainly something we'd love to, maybe we can talk afterwards. Um. One of the issues with, with these types of computations is that the real systems, the parameters aren't known and they're dynamic. That is, you don't know the resistance between A and B. How do you see that interacting with, with what you're doing? Right, so um, again, good question because I, I, I asked, um, I, I was visiting New England, I saw and asked them, if we can solve this OPF efficiently, do you care? It's not clear they care. Uh, and, and the reason is, is the following. There doesn't seem to be, I, I love to hear what uh, Professor Wu think, thinks, there doesn't seem to be a consensus on what is the gap between DCOPF and ACOPF? Some people think that it could be important because, oh, we get these negative prices, probably because we're solving DCs. 
Some people think, oh, it's, it's not very really important. So there's one reason that, that the, some people think that they don't care. The second reason is the thing that you pointed out, which is they said that um, in reality, a lot, there's a lot of uncertainty just in the data. So if I have an error margin is large enough in the data, who cares I can solve an accurate model? So I, I don't know. I think um, if I have to defend this, then I would say that this potentially provides a way. We, we, we don't, we, not that we have, have it now, but it, pro, it, it points to a way for very fast computation. Suppose you can do that. Suppose you can solve big, powerful problems every minute. Then if you do have sensors that you can actually get um, real data, actually from uh, Professor Wu's uh, paper, you, you, we can monitor and control. We, ha we have the hardware capability, or have a technology, not a deployment, but the technology, to, to monitor and control a thousand times faster than we do today. When we have the capability, after investments and deployments and all that, we don't have the algorithm models and algorithms to do it. So this is sort of towards that. That is, if I can compute very, very fast, and if the deployment happens, we can monitor very fast, then perhaps we can deal with the issue that we don't have accurate data. Because if you can, you can adjust quickly, right, then perhaps reasonable data is, is enough. Is that if I, have, if I can control only every five minutes, then the accuracy of data becomes even more important. Uh, so just a, a question about the placement of face phase shifting transformers, it may be unreasonable to justify their installation in order to convex, convexify the underlying power flow problem, but I mean, have you looked at the marginal value of these technologies in terms of reducing system marginal costs like active power, reactive power losses, mitigating congestion? You know, that may be a more reasonable way of, of motivating their, their installation. Right, so exactly. We haven't and we want to do that, exactly. So right now it's extreme simplicity. The phase shift is sort of idealized. There's no constraint on the angles. There's no impedance and all of that. So the next thing is exactly to do what you suggested. That is, include reason, much more reasonable models of phase shifter and see how much benefit do you, can you really get versus the cost, not just the, the cost, but also the loss uh, in, in the phase shift and all that. So that hasn't been done. We'd love to understand that, but, but we don't yet. Okay, I think that's it for questions. So thank you very much. All right, thank Thanks you very much. Love.